Our speaker this evening is uh, Leo Smith, and Leo has been highly involved with the uh, Dark Sky International Group. I think a lot of us think about pollution as water pollution, air pollution, uh, and things of that nature. But light pollution is also an issue, and I think a lot of times we think about it in terms of uh, impairing our view of the magnificent sky. But in fact, light pollution has a lot of impacts on uh, pure environmental issues, wildlife, fish, even humans. And uh, Leo has been involved with the group, trying to bring awareness of the dark sky issue to people, trying to get legislation passed in order to control excess glare and light spillover. Um, so I think his presentation will be very timely this evening, and uh, I'd like to turn it over to Leo. So you said. Hi. Uh, first, let me just start with the overview of how I got involved in this. Um, we have a house in Suffield. It was on Mapleton Avenue. And um, we had a really nice view. In the backyard, there was a 50-acre turf farm that abutted our property. And so what a wonderful thing on our deck. You look back and you see what looks like an infinite lawn. And things happen. Then the turf farmer decided it was time to sell. And he sold it to a developer. And the developer was going to put in these 16 houses, which he did, very nice houses, high end, pretty. But my concern was glare. I didn't want glare coming at me from these houses. We worked with the developer. He brought us a sample of the light fixture it, that they were going to use on the outside. And it was horrendous. But it still had the tag on it that showed who the manufacturer was and so forth. I called the manufacturer and talked to their engineering department. And I said, would it be possible to put the light instead of you seeing the, the lamp, put it in the black metal crown where it would be shielded. Answer, oh yeah, we can do this. Just you know, all you have to do is ask us. So I went back and the developer was very happy to do that. And so all the lights that went in were fully shielded. But with that, I ended up getting involved with Dark Sky. I was a board member with them for eight years. Um, I've been on the roadway lighting committee for 10 years, um, just very involved. And uh, the research that has come about in the last 25 years is pretty phenomenal. What started out with dark sky was really astronomers concerned about the ability to see the stars at night. But since then, the research has gone into things like how light pollution affects bird migration, how light pollution affects plants, how it in actually eliminates some life forms. It's threatening insects, which in turn has to do with being able to, for populations of different animals. So with that, uh, let's start with slide one. So for billions of years, all we had was light and dark. Dark at night, light and day. Next slide. And then about 145 years ago, which is just a speck of time, relative to how long the Earth has been here, we came out with the light bulb. And so that started the issue. Next. So part of the issues now has to do with what are the consequences? What happens with light pollution? Next. So one issue is light trespass, and that basically is instead of designing the lighting so it goes exactly where it's needed on that pathway or street, the light is just blasting out in all directions, including into other people's property. Next. The other is glare, where, for example, when you're driving down the road, if you have street lights or if you have cars coming in the other direction, it creates glare. And when that glare takes place, it actually diminishes your ability to see. So it's not that light helps you see, 
but instead that if you don't have properly shielded lighting, it can actually cause you to see less. Next. Another issue with lighting is, are we lighting to the level that we need to light in order to see where we're going, or do we actually have a situation where we're lighting a lot more than we need? And an interesting comparison is this. Here you have a full moon, let's say, and the sky is clear, and you're out in a field. You can tell where those rocks are. You can see how you have to navigate. The light from that full moon represents two one-hundredths of a foot candle. And yet today, when we set the standards for how much light you need, for example, in a parking lot, 20-foot candle. Hello? You know, do we really need a thousand times more light in order to be able to see where we're going? No, we don't. But that's the way it's been because a lot of the times problems come up when you have people setting the standards that also are involved in the lighting industry where more light equals more sales. Next. So with sky glow, that's the last word, this is what started it all, where the ability to see the stars is not anywhere near as what it used to be. My wife and I took a trip out to um, the Four Corners, which is like the darkest place in the United States, and we went there for the time where there would be no moon and during the dry season where it wouldn't be raining, right? And it was a spectacular show of what the Milky Way looks like. It was unbelievable. But we can't see that here. Next. So adverse consequences include human health, plants, and wildlife, interference with the astronomy. But the one topic we didn't talk about yet is energy waste. And when you think about lighting, you know, you could have an outdoor light that you have on for navigation, but do we really need that on all night long? And even with street lighting, do we need the street lights on or do we even need them at all? And my position is that a lot of the street lights that we have out there are totally unnecessary especially when you get onto the highways, where if you put up glare barriers so that the cars don't shine in your eyes from the, from the other direction, it's easier to see with just your headlights instead of the glare coming at you from the street lights. Next. So this is the world view of light pollution taken from satellites and combined. Next. In the United States, going back to 1960, next, by 1975, what the nighttime light pollution looks like, next, 1997, with no LEDs, this is still back when you had high pressure sodium street lights and whatnot, next. And this is the projection of 20 years after LEDs, what light pollution looks like in the United States. Next. They have something called the Bordel Scale of the Night Sky. And it basically starts out at the nine all the way over there on the left, where you have, you're in an inner city and there's lots of light, you don't really see much at all, all the way over to number one, where you have excellent darkness. Next. So we also talk about energy waste. What are we talking about with light pollution and energy waste? Next. Three to seven billion dollars spent every year on unneeded lighting. 21 million tons of CO2 burned by unnecessary lighting. Next. Here's an example, sports field lighting. Everybody, you know, gets into the question of, you know, let's light the field, you know, so kids play into high school or whatever. And that's a wonderful thing. But when you get into the details, a lot of times there's no attention paid to whether you put in that sports field lighting, this one or that one, what do you do? Sometimes it's who's gonna give you the best price. Next. 
But if you do it right, you can have sports field lighting that will actually cut off, say, 10 feet past the, the, the border of where that field of play is. And everybody gets to, to do what they need to do, but you don't end up lighting into the neighbors or into the sky. And what's interesting about sports field lighting is they, they have four different, what they call, class of play. And class of play four is the lowest rating for lighting. And it represents an area that has no spectators. One, two, and three are places that have, say, up to 5,000 or up to 20,000 spectators, and they need more light. But all the light that they need has nothing to do with the field of play for the people that are playing the game. It has everything to do with spectators that are at a distance being able to see what's going on in the field. Next. So basically, there's just a tremendous amount of energy that is wasted on light. And when you think about the waste, it's not just a question of whether you are over lighting. It's also a question of when you are lighting. So for example, if you really don't need the light to be on after 10 o'clock, we have some situations where there are, let's say, residential streets that the sidewalks, they roll up at 10 o'clock. There's no one out there, right? And not only that, but the speed is like 30 miles to 35 miles an hour. You don't need to have street lights on all night long at 12, 1, 2 in the morning. Next. 99% of outdoor lighting is wasted. And most of it has to do with the fact that it's misdirected. You need the light right here, but the light is going all the way around every which way instead of being focused exactly where it's needed. Next. So there are controls that can be used with lighting that will help a lot. Uh, dimmers, timers. Uh, they do have timers for street lights, for example, where the street lights uh, use something called a photo cell. If you ever look at one when you, in the daytime, you'll see this little round thing at the top. And they screw that on, and it's, uh, the photo cell is what tells the street light to turn on when it gets dark and turn off when it starts to get light in the morning. But they do have what's called programmable photo cells where you can actually set it so that while it does come on at dusk, it turns off at say 10 o'clock or 12 o'clock, you can set it. And they also have ones that'll say, let's drop this energy by 75%. So we'll still have some light, but we're not gonna have that full strength of light. Next. So we get into what, what happens to, to wildlife. Uh, the consequences are pretty broad, um, even to the point of survival. Next. About 100 million birds die every year as the result of light pollution. Why? Because they follow the stars when they migrate. And lighting from the Earth interferes with their migration. Sometimes they'll, we'll show you a picture here next. Um, so basically, the, the light pollution is a better indicator of bird densities than temperature of precipitation or tree canopy cover. Next. Um, light pollution is a top a predictor of the density of bird migration uh, and birds at stopover locations, both in the spring and the fall, all across the country. Next. So there were a thousand birds that were killed colliding into McCormick Place Convention Center in Chicago between October 4th and October 5th of 2023. And this is not for the first time ever it happened. It happens all the time. And part of it has to do with the fact that there are some mitiga mitigation techniques that can be used. Uh, turning lights out is one thing, using films, and I'll show you a slide on that next. So here's an example uh, to how to prevent bird window collisions 
there are films that are sold, you can buy them online, where you can cover your window and it will either be a horizontal type line or vertical line that will basically work with the birds so they don't end up colliding with the window. They don't think that this is a passageway for them. Next. Another interesting thought is, you know, we all think about how we work. You know, we're, we're people that are up during the day and we sleep at night, but what about everybody else? Um, next. Some places, some people, some the birds uh, and animals are totally nocturnal. All the time, 100% of that species is nocturnal. And then you have others that maybe are a little less. The primate species, only 30% are nocturnal. But that's an awful lot between the, the say, 63% of mammals and 63% uh, of invertebrate, that's more than half. Next. So yes, the, the light at night um, has an attraction or repulsion to all kinds of animals and it affects their times that they go out and forage for food and it may end up conflicting with the time that the, their predator is out there so it creates problems there. Next, baby sea turtles, when they hatch, their, their eggs are buried in the sand. When they hatch and they come out of the sand, they look for light. If the moon is out there, they go to the water. Next, but if there's artificial light, they'll start migrating to the artificial light. And what will end up happening is they will die from exhaustion. Next. Take salmon migration. Whenever you have artificial light lighting up, say, a river, the salmon will generally stop at that point of light because they know that this light shows their predator where they are and they don't get to the point that they should be to basically reproduce. Next. You think about insects, you know, we've all seen this kind of picture where the insects are just flying around like crazy around the outdoor light and that they're attracted to it. And recently there's been some substantial research on what it says there, the devastating role of light pollution on the insect apocalypse. The insects are responsible for a whole bunch of things. They, they're, they're food for in the food chain, right? And if we diminish that food chain, we have problems for us. Next. You know, when I was a little kid, I remember seeing all these fireflies out in the backyard. I mean, there were tons of them, right? How many of us today see tons of fireflies anymore? Not many. And uh, next. So light pollution for insects disrupts their flight activity, attracts insects that don't normally move from their habitat, are effectively trapped by light and they have a loss of the population that's detrimental to us as well. Next. So another issue with street lights, and I confess I'm a definite, let's just say advocate for not having so many street lights, but when you think about street lights, how does it affect the plants and the trees? Next. So here's an example, very visual. This is taken somewhere down in New York where you have a street light proximate to a tree. And it's now autumn. And the parts of the tree that are further away from the street light have all fallen off the tree. But those parts of the leaves that are still on the tree, they're close to the street light, they haven't done that yet. Next. 
Another question is pollinators. Uh, next. Bumblebees are responsible for populating a lot uh, in terms of our ecosystem and sustaining the crops. Seven states in the United States have lost the American bumblebee entirely. New York has lost 99%. And in 2021, the US Fish and Wildlife determined that endangered species protection for bumblebees may be warranted. This is under consideration right now. Light pollution is a contributing factor. Next. So one third of all human food requires a pollinator. And many plants and flowers are pollinated by nocturnal insects or small animals, moths and bats and altering the light conditions at night can further unravel our web of life which ultimately disrupts our food sources. Next. And what about us? How does light pollution affect us? You know, we go home at night, it's dark, we watch television, we turn the light on and we read, and in some cases, when you think about kids, you know, some kids are, are, might be afraid of the dark, so we leave a light on for them while they sleep. Next. Well, this all affects melatonin. Our body produces melatonin at a rate that at night will help us sleep as it increases in the melatonin level. But in fact, if you have light at night, it will decrease the amount of melatonin that your body provides. The American Medical Association has been involved. In 2009, they came out with a paper on why shielding lights would be in order. And they were primarily, primarily focused on street lighting. And in 2016, they addressed light emitting diodes. And again, the question of shielding, plus now the question of color, which we'll get into next. So light at night, it's been very recent, only the last 145 years. Um, with 50,000 years prior to that, just sun in the day, you know, and the moon at night. Um, how much this disrupts our rhythms is ongoing research and the amount of research, if you go back 25 years to today, has been growing almost exponentially across the country, different research centers. And more, and more federal grants are now available, all directed to light at night. Thanks, and the next one. So that study from the American Medical Association from 2009 said that they wanted you to use energy efficient lights, which now that sounds like a good idea because you know, with an LED you can have a lot more light with a lot less wattage. Um, they also addressed the light pollution reduction efforts and glare reduction efforts in terms of the fact that if you have glare, if I had a light like this shining at you, you wouldn't be able to see me. But if I take that light and I bring it down like this so the glare goes away, now you can see better. You still have the light. It's just you don't have the glare. And that all future street lights should be fully shielded for safety on the road. Next. Color temperature. This is probably the biggest new part of light pollution that there is. When LEDs were first put out, they had about 7,000 Kelvin, which is the rating that they use, a Kelvin rating. And that determines how much blue wavelength light there is. 7,000 is a lot. And when we remember back to when LEDs first came out in headlights, you remember when we're driving down the, the road and the cars are coming in the other direction? Most of the cars have the old kind of headlights, but every now and then you'd see one that has that sort of whitish blue light coming at you. And what happened? You squinted. Your eye said, I'm not comfortable, right? Because that had so much blue wavelength light in it. Next. 
So in 2016, when the AMA came out with their second paper, they recommended using 3000 Kelvin or lower for all of the LED street lights um, and to be fully shielded and to consider using controls that would allow you to dim the lights during hours when you really didn't need a full light. Um, and the reason that they did the 3000 was that in 2016, that was pretty much what the industry manufacturing side was willing to put out at the low end. Today, they put out 2700K, 2400K, and in some cases 2200K. So it's, the, the industry is coming around because they recognize the fact that there is a problem. Next. And this gives you an example here of Kelvin temperature. You remember the high pressure sodium street lights that we used in the 80s and 90s and 2000s? All of those lights look kind of orangey, right? That was because they had a lot of red wavelength light and not much blue. But as you get higher and higher and higher up the chart in terms of the Kelvin rating, it turns more blue and basically more damaging in terms of light pollution. Next. Can I ask a question on that last one? What's the clear blue whole word sky? A clear word what? It's a new word to me. Clear blue whole word sky? I don't know. That was the last listing you had there. The north sky polarized light. Well, let's go back to the other slide. The, the clear blue poleward sky has to do with the amount of light that if you have no clouds and it's all coming through, this is the sunlight at its maximum. Next. This is the sun. And does poleward mean at the North Pole or the South Pole? You know, I don't know that. Next. So when we talk about curfews and lighting, what we're talking about here are timers and sensors. Timers if you want to turn the light out completely. Sensors if you want to have things like motion sensor activated lighting. Or in another setting, you could say, well, instead of turning the light out altogether, why don't we set it so that at this time of night, the light basically is reduced by 75%. We still got a little light, we probably got enough to see, but we don't really need it on full strength. Next. And then we talk about good neighbor lighting. It's something altogether different, just being nice, right? Next. So in the top left-hand corner, there's the light fixture that's shining in the neighbor's yard. No one likes that, the certainly not the neighbor. Next. And so using shielded fixtures is a wonderful thing. But even if they're shielded, they need to be mounted correctly so that the light goes straight down. You could have a fully shielded fixture, and if you mount it so that it's like this, it doesn't do any good. The light will go straight out. Uh, using those timers and motion sensors we talked about, using the least amount of light that you really need. If you had a dimmer where you could actually dial down the light, it would be an interesting exercise to say, at what point do we get to that level where, yeah, we can see, and we don't really need more than that. Um, and using only when it's needed so that if you have a situation where you need light at night, say up until 10 o'clock, you have a timer that turns it off after 10. Next. These are examples of fully shielded fixtures that can be used in residential locations for the most part. Some of them are street lights. But by law, in 2001, Connecticut adopted a statute that said that all street lights in Connecticut going forward, paid for by the municipality or paid for by the state, had to be fully shielded, which was very good because up until that time, the street lights were going up with, let's just say, bad lighting. Next. 
some more examples of street of uh, lighting that is where they have the light concealed inside. Like on this white one here, you can see where the light is shining on the side of the fixture there, but you don't see that lamp itself. Next. And since uh, 2004, here in Connecticut, um, we have worked with the state building code folks in adopting a light pollution control amendment that requires fully shielded lighting on all commercial buildings. It doesn't apply to residential. Um, recently, uh, the Nash, this, and that is just a Connecticut amendment, so it doesn't apply to any other state, but the International Energy Code does apply everywhere, and they recently adopted one about building facade and landscape lighting, so that if you, as a company, get involved with lighting up your building, you can do that. But if you close, then an hour after you close, you gotta turn your lights off. Or if you do landscape lighting, an hour after you close, you gotta turn the lights on, off. And you can't turn them on until an hour before you open up again. Next. So this is the one that covered the requirements for fully shielded commercial lighting adopted in 2004. So we've had 20 years of experience with this. And what's interesting is there's really been no blowback from the industry. Everybody still gets the light. You still need the fixture. It's just that you're buying what we'll call the good kind. And in most cases, there's no difference in price. You know, so it's not like this is gonna, like a lot of times in water pollution or air pollution, if you wanna really do the reductions, you're gonna have to buy this equipment and that equipment, it's gonna cost an arm and a leg. Here, light pollution can be controlled without having to pay more money. It's just having the awareness ahead of time to know that when it comes time to buy those fixtures, buy the good kind. They don't cost more money, just buy the good kind. Next. Another thing that, that municipalities can do is adopt what's called a street light master plan. And what does that involve? That involves identifying and the, the warranting conditions that justify a street light. We need it at an intersection. We need it across from the fire department. We need it at a school crossing, a traffic light. You identify all those conditions, put them together, and then go out and do an audit. And okay, let's check the box here for every street light that meets one of our warranting conditions. And for those that don't, let's take a hard look at taking them down. And then you also have a side benefit. Your, your town engineer that usually is involved directly with the lighting will sometimes get a resident that comes in and wants that street light in front of their house and is pretty persistent. And part of their argument is that Joe down the street, he has one, right? Well, first of all, with the street light master plan, the town engineer says, hey, it's not on me. Yeah, here's the rules. You don't qualify for one of the conditions, so we can't give you the street light. So from that perspective, it sort of puts him off the hook um, the other thing is that if you really think about it, if you talk about public safety, if you really need the street light for public safety and you only need it right there, then that's fine. But if you start putting street lights in because people want them, and not because it's a safety issue, but just that they like them, then you really need to put street lights in every single household. The same way you agree that if you need to pick up the trash, you're gonna pick up the trash for everybody. Not one here and one there. You're gonna do it for everybody. So by that logic, if you don't have the budget to give everybody a street light, you shouldn't give anybody a street light unless you can show that that street light is required for public safety. Next. 
So another issue has to do with that bird migration that we talked about earlier. This last year in, in the legislature, they passed a, a statute that requires all state buildings to turn their lights out at 10 o'clock and not turn them on until 11 in the morning. And of course, the state capital is exempt from that, so they, you still see. But it all had to do with bird migration. Originally, they said from November 15th to, I forget what the March something was the date, you know, no lights. But then the legislature just said, hey, look, let's just do that all year round because it saves money. Next. So there's five principles that were adopted the, the lighting industry is represented by the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. Then you have on the other side, you have Dark Sky. And those two organizations have been working together to try and find ways to resolve the problem. And so they came up with five reasons why you should have what we'll call a, a theory, a, a, a principle basis for lighting. And what are they? One, the light has to be useful. There's no sense in putting the light out where there's no use for it. It has to be targeted. Yes, we need to light the pathway. That's a wonderful thing. But we don't need to light the side of the building over there. We don't need to uh, put it into the neighbor's window or up into the sky because it doesn't do any good. Next is low light levels. And then that get, brings us back to that dial. If we could only have that dial that we could use to dial down the light to see where it is that we say, hey, our eye says we really need more light, as opposed to like, we really don't need that much. Having it controlled, and this is where you have your sensors, your timers, motion sensors, things like that. And finally, color that you will use warm light every time, unless there's some real reason not to. Those high blue wavelength lights do have a purpose. If you are a jeweler and you wanna have your color of your, of your jewelry really show, then inside that lighted case, you will probably have pretty high wavelength light to really properly display all of those pieces of jewelry. But you don't need that to identify a car or a person or better see that on the, in what's going on outside. So that's the last one. Next. So that concludes the presentation. Um, I do have some literature up here, some cards. Anybody that's interested is welcome to take them. And uh, when we get around to doing the proposals before the State Building Code, Codes Amendments Committee. We certainly would welcome any support in the form of letters to the Codes Amendments Committee that would support the adoption of better light pollution control requirements. And so that's it, thank you. Any questions? It goes across the board um, of the 168 towns in Connecticut, 102 have dark sky provisions. Now, I shouldn't say that. They have, they have outdoor lighting regulations. Some of them are one paragraph. Some of them are three pages. All right, and you get into uh, an awareness uh, among people like the, your your committees that will oversee zoning regulation adoption and things like that. And there has to be a, uh, an interest in stepping forward to say, okay, we don't really have much in the way of light pollution control. So let's take a look at zoning regulations to adopt some changes and requirements. And remember, we're not talking about going back in zoning. It's not like if we do this, all these places are gonna to have to spend money, no. Zoning says, this is the rule. If you're gonna start building today and you bring us an application, you gotta do it this way. 
And if you are doing major renovations and require a building permit, yes, you got to do it this way. But it's not a problem because it doesn't cost you any more money. You're going to have to buy that light fixture one way or the other. So just buy the right one. Next. Can you comment on the new wage auto white lights, headlights? Uh, just say that again, please. The new wage auto headlights, bright white. Can you comment on that? Um, they're probably um, more detrimental then they really need to be. You don't need to have them bright white. There is something now that's just been approved by the Federal Highway Administration called adaptive headlighting. And what it is, is if you driving down the road have your car headlights on high beam, you know how better you can see, right? Well, they've been doing this in Europe for a while. An adaptive headlight is one where it goes like this, it's on high beam. And when it detects a car headlight coming in the other direction, what it does is it moves like this so that the high beam is outside the focus of the car coming. And after the car leaves, it comes back so that you have the benefit of that. And that will end up happening in the industry, but it, because it was just recently approved, it'll probably be five or 10 years down the road before lots of cars have adaptive headlighting. Next. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about, is there a way we can look back at it? Sure. It had Connecticut and it had a green area. Um, so that's the quiet corner of northeastern Connecticut. And it appears that it's not in the red circle, but rather it's to the left of the red circle here. What, what does that depict? What, do, what does this part of the map detect? The, map I the green area seems to show what's, they, they market it as the quiet. That's, that's, basically natural land um, that's that's more dark than say Hartford or Bridgeport or whatever um, and it they, they try to show some of the what they call the Green Valley where the birds use for migrating um, so that's it's, it's there's nothing special about it other than the fact that it doesn't have as much light pollution in it Yeah. Because well, obviously migratory birds are not regulated by any state. No. They travel cold. They don't need a permit. No, they don't. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting to see that the red circle there seems to be in, in Rhode Island uh, and near the, uh, the inlet there of the estuary. We do have a program in Dark Sky that's been going on for maybe 15 years now where parks and other areas can receive dark sky certification. And when they do, they'll use that in their marketing, that this is a dark sky preserve, that type of thing. So we're moving forward in that direction at the same time working with industry where you can now put a fixture before the technical committee at dark sky and if it meets the qualifications, it will be certified as a dark sky fixture. And you can then use that in your advertising so that people that are interested in a dark sky fixture are gonna maybe gravitate to your fixture rather than one that's not certified. Did you say it again? It had, had to do with the, uh, putting new LED lights on the Buckley Bridge to show off the architectural features of the bridge. I wonder if you were familiar with that project. I'm not familiar with the, the Buckley Bridge lighting. It's a $2 million project funded by the state. And they seem to have gone to great lengths in trying to reduce light pollution. But what was left was lights shining into the river. All the lights were yeah. downward. Yeah. And that affects Fish yeah, it does. And not only that, but think about it. Let's say, let's say you spend the $2 million and you lay up the Buckley Bridge. Okay. At 6 o'clock at night in the winter, lots of people see that, okay? Um, 
if they're driving and the bridge is over there, they can see it. But what happens at 11 o'clock, at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? At 3 o'clock in the morning, how many people are really seeing this? And that applies also to things like getting away from the bridge itself. How many of us have seen those vast car open sales lots? Right? The lights are brightly lit, right? Like crazy. And they're there to sort of to sell and display their cars at night when they're closed, but they want people to see them. And even if we say that there's some logic to that, do we really want to say that it's a good thing to do at 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock in the morning when, yes, there might be one person driving by or whatever, we don't need it. So that whole thing about like lighting the bridge and when to light it is part of the discussion now. And the problem has always been that at an agency standpoint, there really hasn't been much agency action unless and until a state statute required them to do something. But it's becoming more common, at least, to, to have some discussion about light pollution issues prior to putting the, the, in the, the next avenue is to actually get light pollution classified as a pollutant, that it harms Connecticut's natural resources. There's a state bill that was just introduced called the Omnibus Climate Bill. And we are going to work every which angle to see if we can insert in there a sentence that says that light pollution adversely affects Connecticut's natural resources. So we'll see. The last time I looked, Glastonbury was one of the towns that really did not have much in the way of zoning regulations to address outdoor lighting. Go ahead. Maybe the question too is when it's on. Like, do you really need that lawn, that lawn all night long, or is it something that you only needed when you were out there doing something and having it so that maybe with motion sensors the lights turn off after, say, five minutes of inactivity? We used to have um, a driveway where we would pull in and the light would come on, and then five minutes later, after we're in the house, the light goes off. And every now and then it would trip with a deer or some other animal, but very infrequently. But that basically means that that light doesn't have to be on all night long and those insects are not adversely affected. Yes. And it's, it's a more recent program that's um, for advocacy um, with um, lights out during migration periods in the spring and the fall in the state. But um, one of the last times I was uh, connecting with Craig and Mer Meredith, they mentioned that they were going to put a package together that would be on the site that could help us um, within our town levels to approach the town with the appropriate steps? Well, Lights Out Connecticut is an organization that was primarily responsible for the state legislation that just got passed last year that required the lights to go out from, say, 10 o'clock until 
uh, 11 or 10 o'clock until uh, 7 in the morning. But the Lights Out uh, program is probably the strongest in Connecticut as far as light pollution controls. The problem that we have in a lot of towns, it has to do more with enforcement than anything else. If we had the best light pollution controls adopted in, say, Glastonbury, that's fine. But what about violators? That requires your state building inspectors, local building inspector, or your zoning enforcement officer to enforce it, which means generally you have to take, if you're the zoning enforcement officer, you gotta go out there and take a look at that light. And when do you see it? You see it when it's dark, right? Well, I, I left here at five o'clock. It's not dark yet, but I'm not coming back here, right? And then even if it were, you know, in December when it gets dark at 4.30 and you could still get out there, the attitude generally is that I have right now so many balls in the air, I can't really take care of these all and you're coming at me with all this stuff? Are you kidding me? Right, they don't say that, but that's really what ends up happening because interestingly, in 2004, when the state building code that required fully shielded lighting was adopted, there were no LED commercial lights on the market. That was 2006, 2007, which means that every LED light that went into the system was required by the 2004 requirement to be fully shielded. It didn't happen. Lots of people decided they do just replace, and sometimes it's, they want to think it's they think it's on the cheap if they get a light and they shine it like this to shine all over there. They can get by with just these two right here. If they had to actually point them down, they might need one here, one there, one there, and one there. So to avoid that, they basically want to have the light that shines everywhere. I took a trip down Route 5 in East Windsor and took pictures at night of tons of violations, put them together with a letter and sent them out to the zoning enforcement officer. And to this day, I haven't heard a word back, right? But I understand, you know, people are busy. They don't really have the time to get into it. And then even if they do, they realize that there's gonna be some political blowback the guy that owns that car dealership pays taxes, and he's probably got the ear of the first selectman, something like that, right? So, yeah. are you I'm really? The news in East Windsor, and I, I can tell you that that's exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, but it's one step at a time, getting a little bit more aware, and uh, I thank all of you for coming down here tonight. Yes. I wanted to make sure. All of the lights now, when you go into the store and you pick up that light bulb and it's in this little paper package, it used to be that that paper package would tell you that it was a 30 watt or a 60 watt, right? Well, two other things are now on there. One is the lumen output. You know, so you have an LED, it's a 16 watt. Well, how bright is that? So they now say that it's going to put out 2,000 lumen or whatever it's going to do to give you some, some idea of brightness. The other line that's on there is a rating that ends in K, like 3,000 K, 2,700 K. But all of that has to do with the uh, 4,000 K is out there. All that has to do with the blue wavelength light. And that, remember the American Medical Association recommended 3,000 K or less. 
all of those light fixtures or light bulbs that you buy now are actually rated. When you look on that paper, it'll have a line there, prominent. It's not one of those things where you have to say it's tiny little letters or says prominent that'll say what the Kelvin rating is on that. And what you look for ideally is 2700K. If they don't have 2700K, then do 3000, but don't do 4000 or 3500. saving them money by le less electrical use. The LED was a great thing. Uh, I don't know if all of you are like me. It took forever to convert everything over, but I wasn't always happy with the color of the light. And um, maybe my eyes were trying to tell me something. The color of the light is what I'll call the big deal today, because you don't need to have the blue light to see better. It doesn't really do you any good. It's just that when they made the LED, it w and they started out with just what we'll call a naked LED, and it was producing 7,000 Kelvin. And then by using phosphor coatings on the LED, they could block a lot of the blue wavelength light. And so now manufacturers are doing that phosphor coating so that you can have that 2700K, 2200K. It will eventually be, they'll probably not have any sales in the 4000, 5000, 7000K. But it's just one of those things where the industry started out without any awareness. Just the easiest thing was to do the, the light emitting diode all by itself. And when that didn't work, there were towns that actually put in street lights with uncoated LEDs that had to take them down and replace them because of all the blowback that they got from residents about how ugly the lights were. So it just takes time.